My, my message is that uh, the whites in this country must step aside. Uh, the blacks and those who are oppressed uh, have been given the first steps to their freedom. Give them opportunity to show what they can do. This will be a form of reparations uh, for, uh, uh, you know, and it will show that you realize the wrong that you did, the wrong you did to God, the wrong you did to your community, to your family over the years. You have generational wealth. Uh, that generational wealth has increased tenfold uh, during the new dispensation. So step aside. Hello, my name is Donald and welcome to the number one media company, Worldview. At Worldview, we explore everyone's perspectives on all things that can broaden our worldview. Today, Geneef Hendricks is a South African politician, businessman, lecturer and teacher and a member of the National Assembly of South Africa. He is one of the founding members of the Muslim Students Association of South Africa and the founder and current leader of Al Jama, a party for upholding Muslim interests in South Africa. Hanif, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, that was quite a nice introduction. One day I will give a nice introduction of Donald. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Hanif, uh, in a recent debate, and once again, thank you for participating in that debate in Wellington. It was great to have your team there and to meet you. Um, you mentioned that you are part of a think tank that is trying to establish ANC EFF coalitions and municipalities or a national government. Can you perhaps elaborate on that? Look, uh, uh, Al Zama has been uh, involved in a concept called uh, co governing. And um, in the previous uh, uh, dispensation, you know, before we had the current uh, uh, elections in 221. Uh, in the year before that, uh, we tested a co-governing uh, concept rather than a coalition. And what happened was that a block of uh, opposition parties came together and uh, we took the lead. And uh, we, for example, then approached the African National Congress because they had the numbers. And at that time, we also approached the EFF because they had significant numbers in the city of Johannesburg. So Herman Masaba of the Democratic Alliance, we were not happy with how they were governing uh, the city of Johannesburg. For example, uh, they were uh, spying on every councillor with equipment uh, that was very expensive and in our view uh, was not uh, properly authorized by the South African National Intelligence can, can Forces. He, sorry, just quickly. So Herman Mashaba, the DA, so you're talking about 2017, uh, quite, quite a while ago, not now in the present time. The, you're quite right. Like I said, the previous election uh, was 2019. So this happened before 2019. So uh, we then um, started uh, 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 the, so it's the, it's the opposition block, let me call it that, that approached the ANC and the AFF and told them, look, let us, uh, you know, co-govern. Uh, the AFF wasn't keen to take a uh, position on the mayoral committee at the time. Uh, we took a position on planning and governance, and we felt that uh, that's where our expertise is, uh, good governance. So our uh, PR counselor, the councillor, uh, uh, fellow Ahmed, uh, uh, he was elected uh, as the MEC for planning. So for that 19 months, you found that there were no problems and that the co-governance took place, that the ANC accepted the invitation of the co-bloc to, to co-govern. So there were two groups co-governing, the African National Congress and the, co and the, uh, and the opposition bloc. 
But then uh, uh, that was scuttled because two of the ANC mayors died. They died on this uh, co-governance uh, arrangement. And then in the next election, uh, the Democratic Alliance, uh, they uh, got the support of the EFF and uh, the co-governing arrangement uh, 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 came to an end. Then the bloc again approached the African National Congress and asked the African National Congress to throw their weight behind the bloc because they had, a, a, they had the numbers. And then the African National Congress, uh, uh, they took up the mayor position in the city of Joburg uh, with the assistance of the uh, political parties in the bloc. But then as it, as it was, uh, the uh, mayor went to court and uh, she is now still uh, 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 running as mayor for the city of Joburg. So the whole idea of the co-governing bloc is that uh, we have established a think tank at the moment uh, consisting of the co-governing bloc on the one side and we've approached the ANC and we've approached the EFF. Uh, let us work together and set a model for 2024. <coughs> So, uh, why, why what not is the other happening? parties? Why not the Democratic Alliance or why specifically the ANC and the EFF? Well, the, 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 the other parties have got their own coalition and uh, they are not interested to join our block. They were invited to join the block, they are not interested. They have their own block, sorry, their own coalition. So, they have a coalition. We have a, a we have a co-governing block, so that is a difference. It's a it's a new concept. People must say it's the same thing. The only difference here is that in the case of the uh, coalition, you find that the Democratic Alliance still calls the shots. They the mayor must come from them, the speaker must come from them and the chief work must come from their political party. So they call, so call the such, and I suppose uh, the uh, funders also fund the other parties. In our case, no one funds us. So um, the, uh, the, we feel that the co-governing bloc is different in that a dominant party is not calling the such, is not taking the initiative. It's a block of smaller parties that's approaching the bigger parties like the ANC and the EFF and the, and the IFP and telling them, look, let's work together for the sake of the residents of the city of Johannesburg. And let us not get together for the sake of our own political parties. So that is the, the difference between the coalition and, uh, and, and, uh, and the block. So the think tank has been meeting for about two months uh, with the idea of uh, speaking to our leadership at national level so that that same model is followed in the 224 elections. So, uh, um, so, so some of the national leadership serves on the think tank. I don't serve on the think tank, although I give uh, a direction to my uh, two representatives. al Zamas supplies the uh, secretarial services uh, to the, uh, the co-governing bloc. And we have developed a lot of credibility. So what is the end game? The end game is that in 224, there will be three parties co-governing. It will be the African National Congress, the EFF, and it will not be al Zama, but will, it will be a bloc uh, uh, which al Zama plays a prominent role in. And um, we've done the number crunching. Uh, according to our number crunching, uh, every party has their number crunching. According to our number crunching, 
uh, the EFF and the ANC will be short of 10 seats uh, to have a 50% plus one majority. So sorry, that thing. Sorry, Hanif, on what do you base that? Is it, is it re recent um, election polling? Uh, why is it specifically the, 10 seats? Look, uh, the, the, there's quite a few organizations that have done forecasts. The African National Congress has also done their forecasts. The EFF have also have got their number crunches. So we are privy to all that information. And all three parties in the co-governing arrangement, uh, we have reached a consensus that there will be 10 seats short. So the EFF and the ANC depends on al and the others in the bloc to bring the 10 seats. So we have three seats. Uh, 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 uh. So we have uh, one seat in the National Assembly. And we have to now uh, increase it uh, to three. And according to the type of work that we are doing, uh, uh, we feel very confident that we, Al Jamal, will have three seats. So the other parties, we have to assist them. And also the ANC and the EFF have to assist them to come up with the other seven seats. So it will be very close uh, come 224. And I'm not sure whether any of the political parties in the DA camp will come to our camp and then they can then join the, uh, the block and make life easier for us. So it's not a sure thing that the, co the three co-governing parties will rule South Africa. So that is what we are faced with at the moment. So uh, the parties uh, in the bloc like al we are upping our game and we want to increase our seats. Interesting. Hanif, um, so Ramaphosa and the ANC, they're interested in working with the EFF on a national level come 2024. Look, the person that is, uh, that's taking the lead is the uh, present premier of Gauteng. So he is quite interested. And the Sufi. Uh, yes, uh, and I have, uh, I've had a long discussion with him. I met him on the sidelines of a national working committee of the ANC, uh, together with other leaders of the ANC. And um, they, uh, they feel that uh, uh, al Zama is a good, honest partner to work with. And we have a, a, a record uh, uh, of working with the ANC for the last uh, so, so seven me, years. Hanif, uh, the ANC makes a determination on who's honest and trustworthy. They're not really, uh, they don't really have a reputation for that themselves. I don't think that's a compliment that you want from the ANC. Well, you must remember that uh, the ANC, uh, they are a mixed bag. So we're talking about individuals here. So he as an individual uh, feels uh, uh, that way. And uh, so uh, we have been working with them. We've been working with other senior people in, in Gauteng. And, um, you know, this is, the, uh, this is now their perception at the moment. And we're happy that, uh, you know, they have that perception. But you may argue, you know, that uh, uh, it doesn't count. But uh, for us, uh, uh, the same perception uh, uh, is uh, in the minds of the other members of the bloc. And we've been successful. We removed a, a speaker. We removed the deputy mayor of the ANC. We even removed the mayor, but the courts have now intervened. South Africa is now run by the courts. It is not run by the people. We are the elected representatives. Yeah. And uh, 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 the elected representatives decided to remove the mayor after, uh, after a debate and a lot of evidence that uh, it is in the best interest of the city of Johannesburg that the mayor be removed. But then the courts came in and uh, they're now trying to rule the country, just like our intelligence forces are trying to rule the country.
De people was hebben. And Hanif, um, what, what is, what, why did the deal in Ukraine, why did that not work out? Why couldn't the EFF and the ANC come to an agreement? Well, like I said, uh, in, the, in, in, in Gauteng, uh, there, are, there are ANC members who, when it comes to integrity, uh, when it comes to obeying the instructions of their political party, uh, they are different. Uh, like Le Sufi. Uh, is a party man, uh, and uh, the, uh, the 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 there are others in the Kuralen who are not, and that's why the chairman for the for that particular region has been asked to step down as a councillor because he blocked the conciliatory efforts of the African National Congress with the EFF. So. Uh, it is uh, all about individuals coming from different factions, possibly, or in a personal capacity that wants to build up their own uh, political empires. Uh, so it's unfortunate that there are politicians who put themselves before their political party. So he had strong views uh, that the EFF uh, should not govern Ekuraleni. But that went against the wishes of the political party, and that's why that deal collapsed. So the first step to restore the trust was for the ANC to show the EFF some good faith by getting the troublemaker uh, to resign as a councillor. Uh, maybe redeploy him elsewhere where we can do less damage. And Hanif, uh, what would Al Jamar's uh, requirements be um, in an ANC EFF coalition. What would be your demands to join such a such a not perhaps a coalition, but be part of that arrangement? First of all, we would like to play a role in governance. So, if there is a cabinet position, uh, you know that deals with governance, we would like to be there because we feel that in terms of our ethics, our moral values, according to our faith, that uh, we are best placed uh, to ensure uh, good uh, governance. And um, we uh, have shown that in the city of Johannesburg. Uh, we have been re-elected in that position in the city of Johannesburg because in the previous elections we have occupied that post. And uh, when uh, uh, the co-governing bloc uh, took power again in the city of Johannesburg, they gave us a position back, which meant that we did a good job in, uh, uh, and they want us to continue that. But now we want to tell them that um, uh, at the national level, we would like to play a role uh, in a portfolio where good governance is very important. And we feel uh, that um, uh, it is necessary uh, for uh, political parties outside the ANC uh, to uh, occupy that position. Just like when it comes to SCOPA, you find that they have a person outside the ANC that looks after the auditing uh, side of uh, parliament. And Hanif, are there some future plans that this think block is planning in terms of municipalities? Uh, for example, is there a plan now in the future for Ikuruleni to work or for another municipality to fall under the control of the ANC, EFF, and perhaps Al Jamal? No, we, like I said, we asked the obstacle to stand down as a councillor. He stood, he has stood down. Those who are supporting him there will now be very careful. Uh, otherwise, I will be asked to step out. So you have, you have step aside, now I have step out also. So um, we feel that the wishes of the EFF will be granted uh, and that they will be given uh, the position of mayor for Elkuleni so that they can get some practice and see how hard it is to be a mayor. It's an easier ride to be on the opposition benches, which they've been doing and shouting and screaming and walking out. Uh, and now let them govern, govern 
and she our tough it is. So it is by time that the African National Congress in a very important metro, uh, 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 you know, show what they can do. Uh, and the other members, although Al is not part of, uh, 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 we don't have a council in Ikurileni, uh, we feel that uh, uh, the EFF will be held to account and they will, uh, and they will prove that they can do a good job. And I'm very confident that a mayor of the EFF in Ikurileni will be the best mayor that that metro has ever had since uh, our democracy. And that that metro will become prosperous and will be a beacon of light for the rest of the country. The EFF has some of the great thought leaders that we have in the country. They've got some of the best intellectuals. And uh, they, well, their why talents... Why don't you join the EFF if you feel so strongly Sorry? about them? Why don't you join the EFF if you feel so strongly about them? Now, how can you expect me to join the EFF if I'm the founder of al Zamar and my intention is to build al Zamar? So nothing is going to stand in my way to, to, to build al Zamar to become a stronger party. I'm not going to abandon uh, al Zamar and join another political party. I will co-govern with it. No, no, I'm, 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 you speak so highly about them. I, I was just curious, why don't you join, when you join them? Um, look, look like the ANC, you have the different people in the organization and some of them you can work with. And we, for example, can work very well with the General Secretary, Comrade Marshall. He is a great leader. Uh, but there are other people in the EFF you know, that we may not be comfortable to work with uh, very closely, but they are there. We can't tell the AFF uh, who their members should be. But we have identified a lot of people in the EFF that we can admire and respect because of their qualifications, their experience, and their dedication, and their loyalty to South Africa. Is, is Malema one of those individuals? Look, uh, uh, I haven't had uh, much uh, contact uh, with uh, Malema. Uh, and uh, the contact that I've had with him, uh, he's very respectful, I suppose, because I'm older than him. And uh, so uh, he shows a lot of respect and decorum. Uh, but uh, he has uh, his style of uh, leadership and of attracting uh, members and supporters. And it seems to be working. So uh, from that point of view, you know, uh, one cannot fault him. And, uh, but uh, I haven't had much uh, dealings with uh, Valema to give my opinion. Ghanif, do you think Ramaphosa should resign based on the recent report that came out? No, you must remember that uh, that report is not, uh, is based on uh, submissions by four political parties and the speaker wanted to show respect to those political parties by putting the uh, submissions, their views before a, let's call it a panel of experts. So the panel of experts has given uh, their take on what has been presented to them. It was not affidavits. It didn't pass what we call law of evidence master. Many people will say it's hearsay. So the speaker has just been very courteous and has uh, uh, given Parliament an opportunity to say, look, the ATM has um, asked for a motion uh, to form a committee to consider impeaching the president. And the speaker didn't on, on her own want to say, look, <clears throat> I'm not entertaining the motion. She gave it to a panel. So the panel has just given uh, its uh, uh, views and it's an appalling report on what was put before them. So yes, what was put before them was uh, uh, damning, but uh, it doesn't pass the test of uh, law of evidence master. You know, the other part there has to put it aside. 
then there is cross-examination, then there is re-examination, and then also the judge intervenes and uh, try and uh, give, put this uh, expertise on the table. Nothing has happened. So we feel that President Ramaphosa should not voluntarily resign at this stage, and the reason is that there is 10 days left for the African National Congress to decide who the next president of the ANG will be and for them to then nominate that person uh, to be elected in the National Assembly. So now in the 10 days, if Cyril Ramaphosa resigns and there is a new uh, president of the country, uh, that person would want to work with people close to his hand. Whoever that person is, he may make some changes to the cabinet. He may make some changes to the security structure in the presidency. He may make some changes to other structures in the presidency. And this presidency has about 35 structures. Uh, you know, so the country is ruled by the presidency, not by parliament. So uh, we find that the... Um, the defense force has a certain, uh, the presidency has a trust in the defense force. A new president uh, may not have trust in the leadership of the defense force and may even make some changes there. To make all these changes and throw the country in turmoil for 10 days does not make sense. Even the school boy will tell you it doesn't make sense. But 11 political parties had a meeting on Friday and they want to put pressure on President Ramaphosa to resign by threatening him with a committee that will be established tomorrow. And that committee will recommend to Parliament that the President should be impeached or not. And that committee's work will take one year. If you look at what is happening to the public protectors impeachment process, uh, it's nearly a year. And um, so uh, President Ramaphosa will then, uh, uh, if he decides not to resign, will be the president of South Africa for the next year uh, with this impeachment hanging over his head. So it is very silly of that 11 opposition parties uh, to think that what they want to do will, su will succeed. They don't have the numbers. But, but and the numbers will come from the uh, elective conference of the ANC in 10 days' time. No member of the ANC uh, will, will, will go against the party position because then their political career has been uh, sacrificed for the next four years uh, because you have a new delegates coming from branches to the elective conference. They're not going to take any nonsense. They're, gonna, they're going to put in a president and you don't touch their president. It may not be so Ramaphosa. So Al-Jama has a more pragmatic approach that uh, this matter must be delayed for 10 days and we must see who the president is that the ANC is now going to put forward to the National Assembly and we must wait for the National Assembly to uh, uh, elect the president that's what members of parliament are there for, to elect a, elect a president. So if, they, if it is Ramaphosa that is a return to parliament, surely they can uh, then put their motion. Uh, I don't think it will succeed, so it's a waste of time uh, because ANC has the numbers. So these political parties should rather concentrate on campaigning and winning the next elections than trying to be branches of the ANC. They, that 11 political parties, now want to be 11 branches of the ANC and tell the ANC uh, at the elective conference, you know, how they should vote. Mm. Uh, and uh, I find it surprising that the respected political parties like the DA and the EFF and the IFP want to be branches of the ANC. They should be focusing on the strengthening their own branches and winning the elections. But, but Hanif, um, why was the president um, willing to consider resigning 
th doesn't that look weak? That he was really, he was, he was basically, he had his mind made up that he's going to resign, and then his allies convinced him otherwise. Isn't that, doesn't that look very bad? It, it sort of looks like an admission of guilt if you were willing to resign. Look, uh, uh, that is what we read in the media. I haven't heard the president saying that. It's all hearsay. Everything is hearsay. Uh, the evidence presented by the four or five political parties to the panel is hearsay. Uh, the media is hearsay. And uh, yesterday when I was on a uh, interview with a national TV station, they were pushing uh, 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 that angle. And when I spoke about the turmoil, it was going to cause uh, the presenter tried to uh, counter uh, my, uh, my sort of uh, view uh, that there will be turmoil and that the president resigning is more important than the turmoil and the harm that it's caused. Her producer stopped her in the tracks. And then she came back and said, oh no, I now have to abandon this line of questioning. Uh, uh, because the, the, she's called it the background says that you got a good point that there will be turmoil, turmoil, and it's better to prevent the turmoil than forcing the president to resign on the national TV station. So even even you media people, you know, uh, uh, you're not getting things right. Yeah, fair enough. Because yeah, the media is pushing a narrative, the president must resign at all costs. But they don't think further than they know. They don't think, okay, if he resigns, what is it going to cause? So I explained that we will have, that this whole matter is intelligence driven. It was our former head of intelligence, the most senior intelligence person in the country that started all of this. So this, you know, this is uh, the sleepers. They are all sleepers. And uh, uh, they, uh, they're now putting their plan in place. So I said, Africa is a run, I said earlier on, you know, by the courts, also by intelligent forces. What, what do you think uh, is the their people plan? must run the country. What do you think is their plan, this other faction that is trying to get rid of Ramaphosa? What is their long-term plan? Well, they have been looting and stealing billions of rands over the years, just like the previous apartheid government did. And amongst their ranks, there are still those thought leaders from the apartheid government giving them orders and direction. So uh, they, uh, they, and we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, a very important uh, person that used to run the intelligence of the country. And I believe that even, uh, you know, other intelligence, uh, 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 I don't want to call them leaders, uh, but operators, for example, in counterintelligence, in other aspects of intelligence. They are all in the game. They are all in the game. And the courts, for example, have played an important role in letting them keep their jobs. Ramaphosa tried to get rid of them. He couldn't. The court put them back in their positions. So the courts, unfortunately, and the intelligence forces are working together to run the country. And uh, their leadership comes from, from uh, uh, leadership from the apartheid government. So we are not free. South Africa is not free. So we have a problem at the moment in that um, those of us who are from the liberation movement or we had our roots in the liberation movement, uh, we realize that the African National Congress is all we have left of the liberation movement. We don't have our uh, uh, hand grenades. We don't have our tires and our matches to burn. We can't do that anymore now that we've been doing dispensation. The only thing that those of us who are involved in the liberation, liberation movement have left is a very weak African National Congress. And now we have to find out, are there any good people, are there any good leaders in the ANC that can take the aspirations of the liberation movement forward. So I'm not convinced they are at the moment. So you will ask me now, why didn't you join the African National Congress? 
You ask me why did why don't I join the Democratic Alliance, but never ask me why don't I join the African National Congress. And uh, I've explained my reasons. That I want to build a strong uh, Muslim political party that is a platform for all other communities. So uh, you know, uh, our constitution, the first line says that members is open to obviously Muslims and through believing Christians and so on and so on. No other political party has that in their constitution. So while we are a Muslim party, uh, we've opened our hearts and our doors to everyone in South Africa. No other political party has done that in their constitution, in the first clause of the constitution. So I hope all your viewers and listeners will now join Al Zama and vote for us in 2024. So we can show a good, good governance for the country. Just a quick note. Um, I asked you to join if you want to join the EFF, not the um, Democratic Alliance. And yeah, obviously you. Well, they're the same. Oh, really? Do you, do you consider the EFF and the Democratic Alliance the same? Well, they've got the same funders. Oh. Mazotti, who, who, who are the same funders? I don't know who the funders are, but I've gone through the disclosures in the IEC quarterly disclosures. So as time goes by, we will read between the lines. But if they are the same, why don't you let the DA keep um, controlling Ikuruleni? Because they don't have competent people to control Ikuruleni. Their mayor has been kicked out on, on merit. The case has been put. The people decide, the people's representatives decided to kick her, to kick her out. And then uh, we find that, um, you know, the EFF started playing uh, politics through their toys out of the court. So they're not interested at that time, in the, you know, they love looking at the interests of the residents of Kuruleni. They were looking at their own interests. They wanted to govern the Kuruleni. And if you don't give it to them, then they throw their toys out of the court and cry like crybabies. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, but Hanif, I want to talk about your history. You have a fascinating history, pivoting. Can you t tell us how were you? How did you get involved in the anti-apartheid struggle? Look, I my mother had two safe houses in District Six. She was a member of the New Unity Movement, a very senior member with people like Dalla Umar and the likes before they joined the African National Congress. So. Uh, uh, in uh, 1960, uh, she, she, she became uh, one of the resistance leaders uh, in uh, the Western Cape and was involved with the trade union movement and also the Teachers League of South Africa and also with the think tank, uh, with a think tank and all of them were part of the new unity movement. And we find that uh, most political party leaders today had a high respect for, let's call it a think tank, an intellectual uh, a group. They didn't throw hand grenades or bomb power stations. They were, uh, they were producing literature and they had uh, intellectual workshops every week. And they were mostly teachers uh, that were mobilizing uh, learners and giving them another view on how to, on the need to fight for their liberation, on the need to become resistance fighters. But they didn't, in, they didn't go into the trenches. Uh, so they played what we call during the liberation uh, struggle, a soft role. So my mom played a soft role. So what was a soft role is that whenever there were any uh, visitors from outside Cape Town that came to visit the Tainis of Robben Island, she would give them accommodation in a, in a safe house. I was about 9 to 11 years old at the time, and my job was to take them to the Cape Town docks, make sure they bought the right boat, and then wait until they return from Robben Island, bring them back home. By that time, she would have cooked a warm plate of food and they would have a meal and then I would prepare the beds. 
because uh, they were very tired and I would attend to some of their shopping needs. I really wanted a face cloth, a bar of soap. So I wasn't interested in politics. I was just following the orders of my mom. No interest in politics. She told me we have visitors here and uh, you will better look after them. And I just did that. So every week we had uh, five people coming. Uh, they, had, they got permits to visit their husbands or their boyfriends or their sons or grandsons on Robin Island. And that permit allowed them a visit every day. So four o'clock in the morning I got up, took them, brought them back to a clock, made up, made, uh, laid out the mattresses for the evening. And uh, so that's what I did. Uh, I, I didn't understand why I was doing it. Uh, all I know, all I knew is that the loved ones were in prison and they wanted to visit them and miss them. And I felt it was a good thing for people to come from Transkai, to come from KZN and come and visit these people. So at least they have visitors. Uh, and I thought, well, uh, these visits will help them transform and uh, become good citizens. So that was what my mom told me. So that's how I got involved in politics. But then we had some of the best thought leaders sharing my bed, sleeping on a double bed. The one sleeping at the foot of the bed and I'm sleeping at the head of the bed. Uh, and they were Africans. And it was unusual, you know, for that kind of mixing to take place in Cape Town. Africans and colors, for example, did not mix. And uh, definitely whites and colors uh, also did not mix unless you worked for them and they were your, your boss. Uh, that was the relationship. So um, some of the thought leaders was, one of the thought leaders was Dr. Achima Feji. Dr. Achima Feji was the first black person to get a job as a senior sociology professor at the University of Cape Town. And then the Clegg's father was a minister of education and banned him from lecturing because of the color of his skin. Uh, he stayed with us. He wrote a book there and uh, uh, I used to go around with him to Langa and Ayanga to the jazz uh, 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 Outlets, you know, he liked jazz, and you know, as a youngster, I liked the jazz as well. I liked the music, and he's to accompany him. Then we had uh, Dr. Judge Fikili Bum, uh, who was sentenced to for ten years on the Robben Island for having a Chinese pamphlet in his pocket. And then we had Phillips Kusana. Philip Kusana was a youngster, not much older than me, in short pants, and used to come and visit regularly. He came to visit Dr. Achiba Feji. He was there, there every day. He was a free boarder. Achiba had paid for his board and lodging because his father was a school principal, could afford it, but not him. And uh, he led the Langa March. He led 30,000 people along the Val Drive, which is now called Philip Kusana Drive. And uh, 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 Sorry, Hanif, I remember him well, telling was, my mom. Was yes? that part of the UDF movement leading that? No, no, this is 1960. Oh, okay. Well, UDF, okay. UDF wasn't even born. No, the UDF was a liberal organization led by white liberals. So those of us who brag about the UDF, they need to have their minds read. Their, their political thinking is not very solid and very clear. Alan Zilla was the treasurer. She still holds five million rand of UDF funds in an account where she's a sole signatory. So uh, you must ask her about that. When is she going to release those funds? And uh, she, will, she will tell you boastfully, I'm a founder member of the UDF, a white liberal new such led uh, organization, inspired organization that provide all the infrastructure. But let's not talk about them now. They weren't even around in the 1960s when the 90-day detention law came out and the 180-day law of detention came out. You could be arrested 
and stay in jail for 180 days without being charged, without a prima facie case against you. Some speaker van Beek would not like you and he would just issue a document and there you go, 180 days. So uh, I was nearly a victim of that, but that's another story. So you find that I was growing up as a 11 year old, 12 year old, very impressionable. What some of South Africa's best thought leaders, liberation movement leaders, they provided uh, the uh, intellectual um, uh, 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 thoughts to liberation movements. Even, even Palo Jordan was part of the unity movement at the time. And uh, all of them uh, frequently uh, visited. So my mom also gave uh, uh, accommodation to sports clubs. You find that there were some sports teams like Kwaru in the Eastern Cape that was one of the best rugby teams in the country. But they had people like Chiki Watson and they had college and African, mostly Africans in their, in their provincial team. So when they came to Cape Town, they couldn't stay at a hotel because, uh, you know, they were a mixed group. And for team, for the sake of team solidarity, they wanted to stay together. So they were prepared to stay up in my, to stay with my mom at a, at a small house and be cramped up. But then the team is together and some team members are not in a white hotel. Other team members are not in a colored hotel and other team members, I don't think they were African hotels, uh, you know, maybe Loving as a Bean or something. But uh, so uh, she also gave accommodation uh, to them. So they were the early people who said, you know, uh, uh, who, who, fought, who were resistance fighters on the sports field. And uh, so we also had the table tennis uh, national, uh, provincial team from KZN who also stayed with us and other sports teams uh, because they didn't want to stay at uh, white hotels or colored hotels. They wanted to be together as a team. So all that, you know, now I have to give up my bed. And uh, when the police raided, you know, I used to be trampled on and hurt. So my mother then came up with a plan that I must sleep under the kitchen table. So the kitchen table was my uh, bed uh, for quite a number of years uh, because, you know, to give up a bed every second day wasn't a nice thing. So I had to have some stability in my life. So my bed was under our big kitchen table. I think it was a 10 sheet. So it was a nice space under the table and I was protected. So uh, that was my introduction to politics. And then um, uh, I played a very important role in the cultural activities of my two schools. So one school was the Fargo High School. That was a political school. You learn more there about politics than mathematics. And um, uh, I then, because of subject choice, went to another school where I uh, got involved in playing chess and I became the school's chess champ and later on the Western Province chess champion. And so that developed my mind, uh, you know, to do what I do today in politics. Uh, you know, how do we checkmate the DA? So, so uh, the chess helped me and it's still helping me today. But then I think uh, when I went to the University of Western Cape in 1969, 1970, uh, my first uh, two weeks at the university, uh, you know, was uh, unbelievable because we as students were asked to burn out school or our university ties. There were some uh, uh, Stellenbosch professors that insisted that you must always wear your tie when you, when you go to classes. And uh, I think they were looking for something to rally students, mobilize students. So uh, the strategists at that time from the Black Conscious Movement 
decided how can we protest, have our first protest at what was called the Bush College, it's now called the University of the Western Cape. So all of us had to throw our new ties into a bonfire and burn it. I, I was proud of my tie. I think it must be the first time I had a tie in my life. Because, uh, you know, uh, we weren't a rich family. And uh, I had to throw my new tie, which you paid a lot of money for in the bonfire. So that was my introduction to resistance. Because uh, uh, my mom worked, my, my, my mom's two safe houses, it is the years of the leadership of the resistance movement, the political parties around. And here, yeah, son is now on the campus. And they knew about how I used to take the Gorgos to Robin Island, four o'clock in the morning, make sure that their beds are made up. Uh, they had some respect for me. And every organization at the University of the Western Cape wanted me to be on the executive. And that's why, that's where I became the editor of the campus newspaper as a first year student. And guess what? I got a, uh, a news editor and that was James Carroll. He was a junior lecturer at the time and also studying. And uh, 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 because University of Western Cape is an Afrikaans university, and he was an Afrikaans lecturer, uh, most of our articles had to be in Afrikaans, and I could only write in English. And uh, so he was my uh, news editor, and then my secretary was Howard Amos, and some other people who later become, became chancellors of the University of the Free State, the University of Stellenbosch. So those were key people that all became rectors. I just became a politician. <laughs> they became rectors. And uh, but, but, but so... You, you grew up English, but you have a very Afrikaans name and surname, which is interesting. And uh, a wife that speaks Afrikaans. So I had to court in Afrikaans. Otherwise, I stood no chance. <laughs> So, uh, uh, but uh, I was also an English teacher. Uh, my major subject at the University of Western Cape was English uh, uh, history and uh, sociology and honors I did in Dustin Psychology. So uh, uh, most of my studies were in English and, uh, but I don't, I've never abandoned the Afrikaans language. Uh, because that is uh, the language that we used to use when we play, uh, when we do our sports, even when we do our religious teachings, it was all in Afrikaans. So now I'm at the University of Western Cape, editor of a campus newspaper and the Black Consciousness Movement is very ripe. And the contestations uh, between the different political formations, worse than the contestations that we have now. What we see, with, uh, you know, what happened at that time, uh, the contestation between the EFF and the DA and the ANC is like a TDB party. At that time it was rough and I'm now the editor of a campus newspaper and everyone wants to have their ideas in the newspaper. They want their narratives in the newspaper, but I had an editorial, editorial board which the SRC uh, appointed that cut across uh, and included most of the political parties. So as a leadership, you know, they had to respect our uh, editorial independence. So then later on, uh, you know, Adam Small, who was a professor in philosophy and one of the great Afrikaners in our community, uh, he recruited me to start a Fees Must Fall campaign in the 70s. So what they are doing now, we lay the roots and the foundations in the 70s. So, uh, you know, I was then standing with placards and uh, trashing lecture rooms 
uh, you know, and uh, what the guys in the fees must fall campaign did now he compared to what we did is like a TDBS party. So that is how I found myself in a reluctant person uh, 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 becoming an activist. I was never a politician because if you're a politician, you must have an ideology, ANG, uh, 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 PAC, and you follow that line. I had no line, but I had a respect and I could work with everyone across the political spectrum. One of my a major achievement at the University of the Western Cape was obviously forming the Muslim Students Association of South Africa. I just felt that uh, these are the right kind of people uh, to put forward the good moral values for the country. So let me mobilize them. So as editor of the newspaper, I, could, I had to visit every campus for experience, networking, and this was paid by the university. So while I was on these trips, I then find out, are there any Muslims here? Where's the prayer room? Where's the halal facilities? Although I must tell you, I always carry two jars of peanut butter with me. So I never used to go hungry because there's no halal facilities. I just used to get a bread and put peanut butter on the bread. And that was my life, eating peanut butter on bread. So now it is 74. And uh, Steve Biko is around. And uh, everyone wants to meet Steve Biko. And there's an opportunity to do so at the University of Zululand because they have a sports conference. So I was the organizer of the bus and all the logistic arrangements to Zululand. So we stopped at uh, the residence of Steve Biko, because he was banned, he couldn't see more than two or three people at a time. And uh, I was too junior to enter that meeting. Uh, so I had to wait back in, I had to wait in the bus. So the leaders, the leaders came out and said that Steve Biko has agreed that from today, and he has consulted with Mandela. I don't know how he consulted with Mandela. There wasn't cell phones. He consulted with Mandela. And from today, colors are blacks. So uh, then I expanded and said, only colors. He said, no, we throw in the Indians as well. They are blacks. So that's where this whole concept comes in of colors and Indians being part of these of the black oppressed, the black former resistance fighters, came from Steve Biko. I then won the chess championships, and, uh, by the way, and I became the national black chess champion for South Africa. Then the, everyone was banned and there was no further championship. So you are still speaking to the reigning, reigning black chess champion uh, of South Africa because another tournament hasn't been held where I could hand over uh, my prize. So uh, that sports conference wasn't a sports conference. None of the rugby players that went on the bus could play rugby. They were all uh, 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 freedom fighters. None of the netball players in the netball team you know, could play netball. And also we're having a, a, the World Cup netball tournament in South Africa next year in July. None of them could play netball. I never saw them playing netball. So uh, even the soccer players, they uh, could hardly kick a goal, but they were in the team. So when we came to Zululand, the university delegation were all the resistance fighters put into sports teams. And I suppose many other univers black universities did the same. So it, it, we had our matches during the day to try and fool the security forces. Because one third of students on the University of, uh, of KZN were all spies. They were all uh, on the payroll of the security forces. So the matches took place, but in between the matches, in between the goals, in between the chessboard games, 
the political strategy uh, to have our freedom like we have today started there. The EFF, uh, 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 their success and growth is because of what was decided there in Zululand in 74. Those people became the, the, resist, the freedom fighters, the new leaders, many of them are in parliament now today and uh, belong to different political parties. So that was for me a very significant event. And I think it's very important that that history should be, uh, uh, should be written. One of the key players was Professor Nicky Morgan, who became the rector of the Free State University. There was people like Edna van Harte, uh, another top uh, activist. There was Cyril Carolus. Uh, you know, there were so many people uh, uh, from the University of Western Cape, you will so call it the so-called college, uh, that played a very important role. And now in the intelligence forces, it's a college set of, that are playing a very important role. You ask me who is the head of counterintelligence, a colored person, who, who laid this charge against Ramaphosa when he was in charge, a colored person. So watch out for us. Uh, uh, don't uh, 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 underestimate us because we're not as white as you. Uh, we are around. Uh, we're playing a very important role in the country. Don't, 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 I, I don't agree with those in the intelligence forces trying to run the country, looting our money. Remember, I served as a member of the Joint uh, Intelligence Committee on Portfolio representing both houses of parliament for a while. So if you want to serve on that body, you need to have uh, uh, state security clearance. I've got the highest state security clearance. I'm a good guy. Uh, you know, you would normally think a Muslim guy getting a certificate of, uh, you know, uh, uh, special clearance. They did a lifestyle order, traced my history since I was a baby. Even looked at my uh, medical cards when I went for my baby injections. And I got a, a, a top level a security certificate. So we're not so bad, we are good guys. It's not easy to get that certificate. Uh, but we have it for the next five years. So that was my introduction into politics. And then, uh, you know, then you, then one wants to get married and you forget about politics. You now want to grow a family. I have a dozen or two kids. But then the university sent me to Libya for my military training. So I spent six weeks in Libya and I had an important role to play to get, uh, get the PAC, the Palestine, the PLO, to convince Gaddafi to give weapons to South Africa. So many people played a role in getting Gaddafi to agree to provide weapons uh, for South African freedom fighters. And my role was I was given a list of uh, liberation movements in South Africa and asked what was the view of the University of Western Cape students, should we give them weapons? So I used to tick the, I won't say who I scratched off and who I uh, approved. But obviously the ANC was one of the organizations in the PIC and Kibla Muslim movement that I said, no, they should get the bulk of the weapons. So the weapons went from Libya to Angola. And from Angola, there was a Russian truck who took it to Freiburg in Cape Town. And that's where uh, the weapons that wasn't distributed was buried. But on the way, you know, people like Modisi, the father of the present uh, Minister of Defense, uh, he got a bulk of the weapons uh, to give to the ANC. And then there was also the Polisario Front that I somehow or another got entangled with. They were, they were fighting for their liberation from Morocco. Both Muslim countries, the one African, the other one largely Arab. So I, I, it, got, it came to my attention that uh, uh, South Africa sent 
120 tanks to Morocco to defeat the Polisario Front because they were supporting the ANC. And at that time, uh, Oliver Tambo was around and he became a member of the Polisario Front, that is in Western Sahara. So those uh, tanks were captured by Polisario Front, half of the tanks, and uh, Polisario Front gave it to the ANC and told them, defend yourself, give it to the countries that's harboring you to defend yourselves against the South Africans who were sabotaging infrastructure in the countries that were harboring South African freedom fighters. And this is the same story I told President Ramaphosa two, three weeks ago when I had lunch with him, with the president of uh, Western Sahara. And he was amazed, he, don't, he didn't know the history. ANC people don't know the history of uh, African countries that supported us during, uh, 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 during our struggle for freedom. Even our own president didn't know the history that I'm now sharing with your, with your viewers. And so, not that he didn't believe me, when we had lunch later on, he said Honorable Hendricks talks as well, the story about tanks. Uh, uh, he, 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 he didn't give me the full picture, so the one guy stood up and said, I was a, a commander at the time. I gave the tanks to Oliver Tambo. And the president was amazed. And then he still went on and said, oh, that's why I decided to be Honorable Hendricks photographer. I took the photo in my white room, which is a, which is a very private room. I took the photo of him and the president of Western Sahara. I'm Honorable Hendricks, uh, official photographer now, and she still me, shared the story with me. So I hope this story will go out because Western Sahara still hasn't got its independence. And South Africa should send them weapons like they send South Africa, guys are having the tanks to defend themselves against Morocco. Why, why do they deserve independence? Uh, uh, if we look at the history of uh, uh, Western Sahara, uh, they, were, they were under the French and they fought for the independence from France and France left the country and they expected to now run their country after fighting 30 years for their independence. And then Morocco invaded them and occupied them like Israel occupied Palestine. Because Morocco was eyeing their phosphates in the desert. They produce 90% of the phosphates uh, that we use uh, in the world. So that was an economic uh, uh, initiative of, uh, of Morocco, just like the West, just have economic interests and want to steal the raw materials in Africa. So Morocco just jumped, uh, you know, jumped the gun and beat the West to it. That's why America supports Morocco. So I'm in a difficult position. Morocco is a Muslim country. I must love them. But Western Sahara is also. It's just that Western, Western Sahara is blacker than the Moroccan. So I think I'm on the right side. Who wants to be on the white side nowadays? The white has caused all the problems that we have in the world over the last three, four centuries. So probably on that note, that is why you wouldn't support, for example, Cape independence, but you would support Western Sahara independence. Yes, of course. Uh, Cape independence, they uh, have hardly had enough votes in four elections to get a, sit, uh, a municipal seat, uh, a provincial seat, or a national seat. So the people have rejected them four times. They went to the polls four times. Uh, that uh, political party behind them uh, puts up double the posters of the ANC at each election. You see their poster on every wall, smiling, but people are not deceived by their smiles. They are a white racist party that brings in some colors so that uh, it's like sharing a power without losing control. So they want to outdo the Nats and bring a brand of apartheid that is benevolent so that they, you retain white power. So they haven't succeeded in four elections. Okay, we took 15 years to get a seat in Parliament, but we got a seat. We've got 14 councillorships. 
So, uh, but the voters have rejected them. Election after election. They got TV coverage, posters all over South Africa. And the people say, no, this is a political party, uh, you know, that must be rejected. But they like rejection. The more they reject it, the more they come, uh, come back and try and uh, push the agenda. So uh, I must admire them for their resilience, carrying on and carrying on. But we cannot have the Western Cape to be the 55th uh, uh, country, independent country of the United States of Africa. It cannot be that uh, we should have a, uh, a 55th country uh, uh, ruled by uh, whites and uh, to further the ideology of apartheid and white rule. So whites have been doing this for centuries. And here in the southernmost part of Africa, they are now wave waving the white flag, the last white outpost in the world. People are integrating. You can't push a, uh, a, a, a white ideology and apartheid ideology. People gave their lives for a united South Africa. They were hanged. They suffered, they struggled. Bantu education has destroyed the education of millions of black children, which will take a hundred years to restore. But that is all for the sake of a united country. Now you want to carve off the Western Cape. And then you're already trying to, to get the Zulus to carve off KZN. in. So on the one hand, we fought a struggle and we've got our freedom. We've got a constitution that we can work with. And now you have a people that want to carve up the country, first the Western Cape. And now then case it in. I don't know which other province they are targeting. Uh, but uh, that's not what we struggle for. So those people who are pushing for a 55th country in Africa, they are disloyal to the country. They are traitors. They should be charged for treason, but because they're such a memory group, a group that the voters have rejected in four or five or six elections, they could hardly get a thousand votes. Uh, people, uh, you know, don't want to charge them for treason because it will just give them more publicity and more power. I was tempted to lay a charge of treason, uh, 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 but it was during election time. And I believe in freedom of speech. And uh, let's see what the voters say. And the voters then rejected them. It's the most rejected political party in Africa. This whole concept, this whole movement is the most rejected movement in Africa. The own people, even the whites, don't support it. Now, how can you how can you support a party when their own kind of rejects them? It's your own kind that knows you and they know no, no, these are uh, this is schoolboy pranks. They must grow up. They need to be to behave maybe like university students or like academics or like business people, not like schoolboys. That's what uh, that this is all about. Well, yeah, Geneef, this has been very interesting. I think we're well over time, but I think that's because we had such an interesting conversation. I want to give you one last opportunity if you want to leave a message to our viewers or just answer a question that, I, that you'd hope I'd ask you. Yeah, no, look, uh, uh, thank you very much for, for this opportunity and I must congratulate your, uh, your media house uh, for being open to diverse views. Not every media house will give me this opportunity. I appreciate that. My, my message is that uh, the whites in this country must step aside. Uh, the blacks and those who are oppressed uh, have been given the first steps to their freedom. Give them an opportunity to show what they can do. This will be a form of reparations. Uh, for uh, uh, 
you know, and it will show that you realize the wrong that you did, the wrong you did to God, the wrong you did to your community, to your family over the years. You have generational wealth. Uh, that generational wealth has increased tenfold uh, during the new dispensation. So step aside, uh, you know, and let, uh, I don't say us, uh, in a, the, you know, uh, but what I want to say is, you have, uh, you know, oppressed, you've killed people, you've committed the worst crimes uh, during our present civilization. Step aside now and, uh, and see how you can assist uh, those that uh, were oppressed in the past uh, to run a good country. Give us a chance. I'm confident that uh, we will succeed. You still have the land, you still have the economy, and uh, keep half of the land, keep off the, the common economy, throw it into the fiscus, and let us build a strong South Africa. Then maybe God will forgive you one day. Thank you very much. Sorry, just a quick question. I forgot to ask you this. Does South Africa belong to all who live in it? Do you agree with that statement? South Africa belongs to all that live in it, but all that live in it should not rule. The whites must step aside. If the whites can just step aside, then South Africa will move forward. Great. Well, thank you so much, Geneef. This has been very interesting to our viewers. Please share Geneef's message. Like this video, share as widely as possible, and subscribe to our channel for more such content. My name is Donald, and you've been watching Worldview.